Hey guys, I want to look at a passage in the book of Jude. Now the book of Jude is talking about this warning about false Christians in the church, false teachers and false Christians who are in the midst of the church. They are contaminating the church. They're lawless. They're living in sin and their, their sin is spreading to others. And he's warning. He's saying the apostles told you this is going to happen. And now look, it's happening. You guys got to be on guard. And we've talked about this extensively in our Dead Church series, but there's something that Jude says specifically that I want to draw attention to. Jude, talking about these false Christians, said, It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So here in this passage, Jude is saying, look, Enoch said that this was coming. Enoch talked about these Christians, these, these false Christians that live in our midst. He was talking about them when he said this. But there's one problem with this. We don't have anything in our Bibles of Enoch saying that. And this is something that for a long time, I, growing up in the church, I would read that and I'd be like, what is he talking about? And I'd go and I'd flip through the Old Testament and look for it. And it's like, there's nothing there. Where is he getting this from? And this is what I want to talk about in this video and actually a few videos that we're going to make is we want to look at this passage here and a number of other passages throughout the New Testament. And we want to talk about where Jude is getting this quote from, because it's really important for us to understand where this is coming from. So just to give you a little bit of background, historical background information, Jude is quoting what is known as the Book of Enoch. Now the Book of Enoch is a book that was heavily referenced in the early church. A lot of early Christian writers talked about the book of Enoch. We have references to it, then referring to it as the book of Enoch, this book written by Enoch that was around back then 2000 years ago. However, what ended up happening is when the Christians decided what books to include in the Bible, they basically had a meeting where they all cast their votes for New Testament books. The New Testament books were largely the writings of the apostles, and there were books that were included, and there were books that were not included, and they voted on which ones to include and which ones not to include. And the ones they did not include are referred to as the New Testament Apocrypha. So that's how they decided on that. However, the Old Testament, what a lot of people don't realize is that the Old Testament at that point, they decided to go with the books that the Jewish people included in their Old Testament. That was, it was really that simple. They said, we're just going to go with what they consider to be scripture. We're going to say that's our Old Testament. And the problem with this is that that all occurred around the 300s AD. But, you know, that's 300 years after Jesus. And at the time of Jesus... There really was not yet an established Jewish canon of scripture. Okay, canon of scripture just simply means the books that are considered to be genuine, the books that are considered as genuine scripture. It became a collection. These are the ones we accept as scripture and these other ones we do not. However, at the time of Jesus, there really was not an established canon of scripture. Jesus and the apostles, they didn't have that tradition. 
there was no definition of these ones are scripture and these ones are not. That did not exist until after Jesus. And that's really important for us to recognize because what ended up happening was after Jesus in 70 AD, Jerusalem was attacked and it fell and Judaism was kind of changed drastically from then on. The people in the New Testament who are referred to as the Pharisees became known as simply the rabbis. And this is where rabbinical Judaism, which still exists today, this is where it got its roots, okay? It was the Pharisees became rabbinical Judaism. That's really dumbing it down, but that's the gist of it. The rabbis, especially a guy named Rabbi Akiva, they came along and they said, we're going to establish which ones, which books are really scripture. They came and they established the Jewish canon of scripture. So they're the ones who decided on which books to include in the canon of scripture and which ones not to include in the canon of scripture. But the problem is, again, this was about a hundred years after Jesus. And the problem with that is Rabbi Akiva and many of the rabbis at that time absolutely hated Jesus. They absolutely hated Christianity. And their whole goal was to discredit Christianity and stop the spread of that movement. And these are the guys who picked which books belong in the Old Testament. They are the ones who established the canon of scripture that we still use today. Because then 200 years after them, that's when the Christians came along and said, we need to establish a canon of scripture. And we, they just said, we'll use what the Jewish people are already using. But what the Jewish people were using was established 100 years after Jesus by people who hated Jesus. And this is all really important when we come back to this quote from Jude referencing the book of Enoch. And we're going to show you that throughout this little series. However, as for the book of Enoch, at that point when it fell out of favor with the people, it was no longer considered scripture by the Jewish people and it was no longer considered scripture by the Christians, it disappeared. People lost the text. We no longer had copies of it around in the Western world. This all lasted until around the 1600s. In the 1600s, a guy went down to Ethiopia in Africa and he discovered that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church had a book in their Bibles called the Book of Enoch. And this was kind of a surprise to everybody because we still had these writings of the early church Christians who were writing, referencing some book called the Book of Enoch. We had this reference in Jude and we knew that that was coming from some book called the Book of Enoch, but we didn't have that book anymore. And so he goes down to Ethiopia, he finds they have a book of Enoch. This kind of fascinated everybody. And eventually that book was brought back to the Western world. It was translated into English and became referred to as the book of Enoch. However, all the scholars and all their wisdom told everybody that's not the real book of Enoch. It's a fraud. It was written after the fact and just quoted Jude to make itself look like it was what Jude was quoting. And this kind of became the widely held belief for a while because, you know, obviously everybody follows the scholars. They know what they're talking about and they don't say things as speculation. They, they teach their own speculation as fact. They say, this is what it is when it's really just a guess. This is what they do. This is why I really hold to the fact that you should not just blindly follow the scholars. And that's also why Jesus said the truth is hidden from the wise and the educated in the world. However, what ended up happening was in the 1950s, give or take, 1940s, 1950s, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found the Book of Enoch. And it turns out the Book of Enoch in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which predates Jesus by at least a couple hundred years, was the same book that the Ethiopians had. So it turns out the scholars were completely wrong when they said that's fraud. And it is the book of Enoch that was referenced by Jude, was referenced by the early church fathers. It was eventually found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We know it predates Jesus. We know that this is the real book of Enoch. Now those scholars just altered a little bit and they now say, okay, well fine, it's the book that they were referencing. But it was not really written by Enoch, and it's, it's still a fraud. It wasn't really written by Enoch. Okay, well, 
We already know not to trust them because they were speculating and teaching us fact once and were proven to be wrong. So why would we trust them now? That's my take on it. But I want to show you what they're currently saying. So on the screen here, I have a timeline. This comes all the way from creation all the way to today. And I've highlighted a few particular moments along the way. For example, Enoch lived approximately 600 to 1,000 years after creation. Moses came about 2,000 years after Enoch. The Babylonian captivity and the time of Daniel was about a thousand years after Moses. Maccabees was about 300 to 400 years after that. Jesus was about 200 years after that. And we are 2000 years since Jesus. Now I highlighted Moses and Daniel slash Babylon for a reason. And I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. But what I want to point out now is that when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, it became very obvious that the book we currently have called the Book of Enoch is in fact the book that predates Jesus. So scholars agree that the book that we have that's called the book of Enoch came sometime before Jesus. Then it just became a matter of determining when it was written. Currently scholars are saying that the book of Enoch was written sometime around here. This is shortly after the period of the Maccabees. Now it should be noted that if scholars are correct that the book of Enoch was written at this time period, it means the book of Enoch shouldn't be paid attention to at all because the book of Enoch claims very explicitly that it was written by Enoch prior to the flood all the way back 2,000 years before Moses and only 600 to 1,000 years after creation. The book of Enoch explicitly claims that it was written at this time period. So if the scholars are correct, then the book of Enoch is totally fraudulent and it's full of lies because it's claiming to be written by someone else at a completely different time period. So the scholars say that it was written roughly 200 years before Jesus. However, this is what I want to talk about. The reason scholars say it was written here is because they claim that it describes events that occurred during the time period of the Maccabees. And to the scholars, that means that it has to have been written sometime after the period of the Maccabees. In other words, they are not giving it any slight bit of possibility that it was given to us by God as it claims to be, that it was written by Enoch as it claims to be, and therefore could have been predicting the future as it claims to be. They're not even giving it the slightest possibility that that's true. And I'm going to come back to the importance of that in a second. But what I also want to talk about is the fact that in the book of Enoch, it's not even explicitly describing the period of the Maccabees. That is entirely an interpretation that the scholars are giving it. That section of the book of Enoch is a parable and it does not explicitly refer to the Maccabees. It could be referring to Jesus. The scholars are saying it doesn't refer to Jesus because the scholars know that it predates Jesus at least somewhat. So they say it couldn't have been referring to him. It must have been referring to something before Jesus. And so they assume it's talking about the period of the Maccabees. However, we need to look at their reasoning. The scholars are saying that the book of Enoch describes events that occurred during the period of the Maccabees. Therefore, according to their argument, it must have been written sometime after the period of the Maccabees. However, when they look at that section of the book of Enoch, they say this is talking about the Maccabees and we know that because it was written shortly after the period of the Maccabees. This is circular reasoning. They're saying this was definitely written after this time period because it describes the events of this time period. And we know that it's describing the events of this time period because it was written shortly after this time period, which we know because it describes the events of this time period. And we know it's describing the events of this time period because it was written shortly after this time period. On and on and on and on and on. This is called circular reasoning. And yet, this is what the scholars are holding to, and this is what they're using to date the book of Enoch. Furthermore, what a lot of Christians don't realize, 
is that these same scholars do the same thing with books that are included in the Bible. For example, Christian scholars generally hold that the books of Moses, the law of Moses, was written sometime after the Babylonian captivity. They say the law of Moses was written or at least finished sometime after the Babylonian captivity. And the reason they say that is because Moses told the Israelites, if you do not follow this law, you will be taken away into exile. The scholars read that and say, oh, well, this portion must have been written after the events occurred. They're saying this about the law of Moses. These are Christian scholars. These are the guys who are writing your theology books. These are the guys going to seminary. This is what they hold to. They're saying the law of Moses was written at this period because it predicted the future. The law of Moses explicitly says it was written back here by Moses a thousand years before the Babylonian captivity. The scholars say that's not possible. Therefore, it was written up here or at least completed during this time period. Furthermore, these scholars, these Christian scholars, say that the book of Daniel was written sometime after the period of the Maccabees. And they say that because the book of Daniel very accurately describes the time period of the Maccabees. So they say, well, it was clearly written after the fact. More than that, the scholars say that Daniel was not even a real person. They say he was a fictional character. We need to understand that this is what Christian scholars are taught in seminary, and this is what they believe. Jesus, the Son of God whom they say they believe in, Jesus taught from the Law of Moses, giving it credibility and saying it was real, and Jesus referenced Daniel and called him a prophet. So these Christian scholars who say that Jesus is the Son of God, they're denying what Jesus said about the Law of Moses, and they're denying what Jesus said about Daniel. And that's the exact same argument they use to date the Book of Enoch. So this is what we need to realize. Whenever we hear them say the Book of Enoch was written only a few hundred years before Jesus, this is what they're basing it on. It's not an argument that holds any water if you believe that God can predict the future. I understand an atheist might make this argument, but if we believe the Bible is true and breathed out by God and that God can predict the future, then this is not an argument we should be accepting. And it is disgusting that our Christian scholars accept this argument because the only reason for them to accept it is because they don't want to look like fools to their secular colleagues. Their secular colleagues would never accept the idea that the book of Enoch was written prior to the events it describes, or the law of Moses, or the book of Daniel, and these Christian scholars don't want to look like fools to their secular colleagues, so they go along with that belief. However, what I also want to point out is that these Christian scholars who believe that the book of Enoch is fraudulent, that it was not really written by Enoch, that it's not truly predicting the future, but that it's just a Jewish book written sometime after the period of the Maccabees, these same guys fully acknowledge that the book of Enoch was heavily, heavily influential on the New Testament writings. That the apostles taught from this book, that they referenced this book, that Jesus himself referenced this book. They acknowledge that the apostles were getting their theology from this book, which according to these scholars is a book of lies. This doesn't make any sense for these guys to be Christians and yet believe this. And yet this is exactly what's going on. It's as nonsensical as it sounds. They say the book of Enoch is not real. They say it was not written by Enoch. They say that it is a fraudulent book written only a few hundred years before Jesus. And yet they also say, and they openly acknowledge that Jesus and the apostles drew from this book extremely heavily, that they were influenced by it. They taught from it. This is something that they can't deny because, quite frankly, it's super undeniable when you read the book of Enoch. I want to give you an example really quick of one of these scholars who is saying all this. So I'm going to show you a clip real quick from a guy named Dr. Michael Heiser. Dr. Heiser is 
considered the foremost expert on ancient Near Eastern culture and religion and language. So the area of Israel and the surrounding cultures, this guy is the foremost expert on what the ancient Israelites believed. So this is, this is not some small time guy. This guy is considered basically the top dog in this area. But I wanna show you a clip really quick where he acknowledges very clearly that the book of Enoch is extremely influential in the New Testament, that the apostles were teaching from it, referencing it, and drawing from it heavily. And yet he also says that the book of Enoch was not written by Enoch and that it's not scripture. Furthermore, he alludes to his idea, which he states blatantly in some of his other work, he alludes to the idea that the law of Moses was not written by Moses, which is something he believes, which is something he states directly in some other sources. And this guy is a top Christian scholar, not secular. This guy is one of the biggest heavy hitters in the theological world. So hear what he has to say, and keep in mind, if he's right that the book of Enoch was not written by Enoch, then it is a fraudulent book. But if he's also right that the New Testament writers were drawing heavily from it, then that means that if the New Testament's really inspired by the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit was drawing heavily from a book full of lies. That is what the scholars believe, whether or not they would put it in those words. So listen to what Dr. Michael Heiser has to say. And primarily, I want you to focus on the fact that he is acknowledging and scholars acknowledge, because it's undeniable, they acknowledge that the New Testament is built on the foundation of the Book of Enoch. So who cares what they have to say about what the Book of Enoch is? If the New Testament is built on the Book of Enoch, and if the New Testament is breathed out by God and inspired by the Holy Spirit, then the Book of Enoch can't be what the scholars say it is, because if the scholars are right about what the Book of Enoch is, then the Book of Enoch is a book of lies, claiming to be something it's not. And yet the scholars also acknowledge that the New Testament is built on it. So... Keeping all that in mind, remembering that Dr. Heiser does not agree with me, he thinks the Book of Enoch is fraudulent, here is what he has to say. Again, whoever wrote Enoch knows the full backstory that's behind Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Whoever wrote Genesis 6, 1 through 4, Moses or somebody else, they know the story too, but they've condensed it, and they don't bother to tell their readers all of the backstory because they just assume their readers know it. They just assume that. You know, unfortunately, for us, we don't know any of this stuff. Okay? Peter knows this literature. And because he's read it, he has a fuller picture of what Genesis 6, 1 through 4 means, how it operates, why it's there, why the first four verses make sense of the fifth verse, that the human wickedness, it juxtaposed to the sons of God event. Peter understands that, and he uses it in his discussion to avoid false teachers. It makes perfect sense across the board for him to do this. Genesis 1 through 11 was either, you know, written during the exile or was heavily edited, again, using the Akkadian Babylonian material to, to articulate a polemic, a theological polemic in those 11 chapters. And that, if that's the case, well then, you know, since that's part of the Torah, then, you know, you have the, the same question arise uh, for different reasons, you know, about the rest of the Torah. My view is, again, just generally, and then I'll get to the, to the specifics of the question is that I, I don't accept JEDP, the, 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 you know, the consensus view among scholars that the, the Pentateuch, the Torah, was not written at all by Moses. It's a, it's a patchwork quilt of sources and so on and so forth. I don't accept that view, but I also don't accept the, the traditional view that Moses you know, wrote, wrote the Torah, you know, 99% of it or 100% of it. Enoch, the book of Enoch, all, scholars refer to it as first Enoch. There's, there's actually more than one. But the first one is the one that counts because it, it dates before the New Testament. It is a, a piece of literature written by very theologically faithful conservative Jews, a Jewish writer. How many of us have been treated to the TV show? It's always around Easter or Christmas. You know, the TV show, the magazine on the impulse shelf at the grocery store, you know, where it says, you know, the, the Christ of faith versus the Jesus of history, you know, trying to drive a wedge between these two things and how the New Testament writers, you know, the, all this theology about the deity of Christ and pre-existence and messiahship, and this is all invented by the church later and thrown back into the New Testament. Well, yeah, except for books like Enoch that have all that stuff in it a couple hundred years before Jesus showed up. <laughs> you know? So it, it's a really good example of how Jews were thinking about Messiah 
prior to Jesus. Now, there's a lot of other stuff in the book that bleeds into the New Testament or that comments and shows you how Jews and serious people, they think the Hebrew Bible is the word of God, you know, like we do, okay? But how they're thinking about the Old Testament, but also, again, you, you get this these streams of interpretation that when you get to the New Testament, it's like, okay, you know, if I had read the book of Enoch, I would think I've seen this before. So it really cuts off at the knees a lot of these, these notions that New Testament writers are just making stuff up. Uh, they're not. They, they are firmly within one strand of what we would call intertestamental Judaism. And it, it's very interesting to see how they were handling Old Testament passages and how that compares with what the New Testament writers are doing. Um, so it, it contextualizes what New Testament content is, you know, about Messiah and about other things. The Book of Life, these heavenly books. There's a lot of stuff like that in Enoch. Lake of Fire, Final Judgment, just the general, you know, apocalyptic stuff you know, that you read in the book of Revelation. Guess what? Enoch was there first, you know. So th there's there are these threads that just run through from the, the Old Testament through the Jewish, the serious Jewish community in between the Testaments on into the New Testament. And so it just helps us be better readers of the New Testament. We, we kind of know and, and can get at what they're, you know, we can pick up what they're laying down a little more because we have some of this other literature to help us show how, how they were thinking, what they were basing these interpretations on in certain passages, you know, the Old Testament or just, you know, commentary within the, their own community about, look at all this stuff in the Hebrew Bible. I wonder what it means. You know, like, how do we connect the dots? So they're busy in, the, in between the Testaments doing that. And the New Testament writers, you know, are, will often repurpose and utilize, you know, that sort of content. So it just, it, it helps us be more intelligent readers, you know, of the stuff that is inspired. I don't think Enoch is inspired. I, I understand the question because there were a few old, you know, early church figures that, that thought and argued that Enoch should be included in the canon, which was a, a debate that was, you know, overwhelmingly lost. <laughs> and, and those guys owned up to it. You know, it's like, okay, we lose. You know, we, we assume the Holy Spirit has guided the masses of the church one direction and it ain't ours. We're, we're okay with that. Um, so I know why the question is asked, but a, a book doesn't have to be canonical or inspired to be useful. You know, Peter quotes from Enoch, Jude quotes from Enoch. There's stuff in the Gospels that, again, are directly traceable to, to things in Enoch. And, you know, it has its, its fingerprints on the New Testament in a lot of places, even if it's not a direct quotation. So it's, it's useful to know what in the world the book's about. Now, these guys call themselves Christians, okay? They say the book of Enoch is not scripture. It was not written by Enoch, but the apostles got their theology from it. And they use that in the New Testament. And these guys who call themselves Christians are basically saying this book is a fraud and yet the New Testament is built on it. They have to acknowledge it because it's really obvious if you read the book of Enoch, you see it. It was extremely influential in the writing of the, of the apostles. And I would argue if the New Testament is truly scripture and it was heavily influenced by the book of Enoch, then maybe we shouldn't just throw the book of Enoch in the trash like the scholars are telling us to do. Maybe we should stop following man's tradition and we should start reading this book. And that's what I want to look at in this series because there's a lot of evidence throughout the New Testament that the book of Enoch really should be considered scripture. And I know that's a controversial view, but I'm asking you, please bear with me through this series. Hear me out, hear my arguments, and look into it for yourself. There's a famous quote that says, condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. And I really like that because it's basically saying if you're going to reject an idea without even looking into it, you don't know what you're talking about and you have no grounds to stand on. If you're going to just turn your back on something and say, no, that's impossible and you're not even willing to hear it out, then quite frankly, you and I can't even have a conversation because you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what the arguments are. You are just dogmatically holding to the view that you already have. And that view you have quite frankly, comes from the traditions of men who Jesus said to the Pharisees, you reject the word of God for the sake of your own traditions. Now, what greater way can you reject the word of God than by actually taking it and saying, this is not scripture. And you do it purely for the sake of your own traditions. So I'm not asking you to just accept what I have to say, but what I want you to do is hear my arguments and bear with me and then look into them for yourself. Like the Bereans, they heard Paul. They didn't agree with Paul, but they were willing to hear him out. And then they searched the scriptures themselves to see if it was true. And the book of Acts says many of them were saved because they were willing to do that. And that's all I'm asking you to do.
So, back to the book of Jude. Jude says, again, It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Okay, now just for reference, I'm going to read from the book of Enoch the verse that Jude is quoting. So this is now not from the book of Jude. This is from the book of Enoch. And I'm going to put these on the screen so you can compare them. And behold, he comes with tens of thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness, which they have ungodly committed and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, if you look at these two verses side by side, you can see that this is pretty much a direct quote. Okay, the translations are a little different, only slightly, but it's it's a direct quote. And scholars recognize this. They recognize Jude was quoting the book of Enoch. And that's really important. Again, the book of Enoch, we now know, predates Jesus. It was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is really important. It pre Dates Jesus. We're going to keep coming back to this in this series. We know it predates Jesus. We know this is the book that Jude was quoting. It is a direct quote. Okay, this is really important because there are a lot of people out there who really value the book of Enoch and they say the book of Enoch is definitely scripture. I agree. But the argument they put forward is really weak because they say, look, Jude quotes it, therefore it's scripture. And the problem is people don't buy that argument because, for example, Paul quoted Greek poets. Doesn't make those Greek poets scripture. So it's not really a good argument to say, well, Jude quoted it, therefore it's scripture. However, what I don't hear anybody arguing, which everyone should be arguing, is the fact that Jude did not just quote it. Look at what Jude said. He said, it was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, what? It was about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied. He did not just say, Enoch said. No. He said, Enoch prophesied. Jude is telling you in plain words that the book of Enoch is prophecy. Okay, this is really important because Jude is saying this book of Enoch is prophecy. So what is prophecy? Well, let's use scripture to evaluate all of this. Peter said, no prophecy ever came from what a person wanted to say, but people led by the Holy Spirit spoke words from God. So Jude says the book of Enoch is prophecy. He says that in plain words. You can't get around that. He's not just saying, hey, this book of Enoch says this thing. No, if, if that's all he said, okay, well, maybe we could dance around that and say, well, that doesn't make it scripture. I agree. You could dance around that. But he didn't just say that. He said, he said, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied. That means that Jude, the apostle Jude, in scripture, breathed out by the Holy Spirit, Jude is saying the book of Enoch is prophecy. Peter tells us that prophecy is when people are led by the Holy Spirit and they speak words from God. Okay? Led by the Holy Spirit, speaking words from God. That is what prophecy is. So what is scripture? We get our definition of scripture from the New Testament. We get our definition of scripture primarily from 2 Timothy 3, 16, where he says, all scripture is breathed out by God 
and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting faults, and for training in righteousness, so that God's person will be competent, fully equipped to do every good work. So, all Scripture is breathed out by God. This is where we get our definition of Scripture. Scripture is that which is words breathed out by God. And prophecy, according to Peter, are words that are breathed out by God, people led by the Spirit, speaking words from God. That is the same thing. And Jude, in Scripture, told us that the book of Enoch is prophecy which means the book of Enoch is scripture. This is a very compelling argument, but it's not the only one. In Matthew 22, the Sadducees come to Jesus and they try to trap him. And now there's a few important things to recognize about the Sadducees. Number one, they do not believe in the resurrection of the dead. In other words, they believed that when a person dies, that person is dead forever, and there is no coming resurrection where we're all going to rise from the dead and live forever. They didn't believe that. So that's one important thing to note. The second important thing to note is this. The Sadducees, unlike the Pharisees, unlike all the other Jewish people of the time, the Sadducees only read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those were the only five books that they considered to be scripture. They didn't consider any of the prophets, any of the Psalms, or the book of Enoch to be scripture. So they only read Genesis to Deuteronomy. And that is really important. Here's what happened. That same day, some Sadducees came to Jesus and asked him a question. Sadducees believed that people would not rise from the dead. They said, teacher, Moses said, if a married man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Once there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died. Since he had no children, his brother married the widow. Then the second brother also died. The same thing happened to the third brother and all the other brothers down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Since all seven men had married her, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Jesus answered, You are deceived because you don't know what the scriptures say, and you don't know about the power of God. Because at the resurrection, they will not marry, nor will they be given to someone to marry. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, this is a passage that a lot of Christians read and just start speculating and making up their own ideas about what Jesus is talking about. But the problem is, we're just like the Sadducees. Because the Sadducees, according to Jesus, they were deceived because they did not know the scriptures. Let me ask you, why did they not know the scriptures? The Sadducees didn't know the scriptures because the Sadducees only counted Genesis to Deuteronomy as scripture and they didn't read anything else. Jesus is saying, you guys are wrong because you don't know scripture. You don't read it. But what's really interesting is he doesn't then jump in and reference Psalms or the prophets. No he immediately references the book of Enoch. And again, Christians begin speculating, what does this mean? What does this mean? And it's because they don't know the scriptures. They are deceived because they don't know the scriptures because they don't read the book of Enoch. Jesus is saying, you are deceived because you do not know the scriptures. And he quotes Enoch or at least references directly Enoch. What does that mean? The obvious implication is Jesus himself, the Son of God, is saying the book of Enoch is scripture. And he's telling the Sadducees, you guys are deceived 
because you don't know what Enoch said. You don't know what you're talking about because you don't read all of Scripture and the book of Enoch is Scripture. So what is he referencing in the book of Enoch? Well, just to give you a little bit of background, the book of Enoch is, to a large extent, the story of what was going on before the flood. And it is the full story of what is summed up in just a few verses in the book of Genesis. Genesis says in chapter 6, the number of people on earth began to multiply and daughters were born to them. When the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, they married any of them they chose. The Lord said, My spirit will not remain in human beings forever because they are flesh. Their days will be only 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also later. That was when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man. These women gave birth to children who became famous and were the mighty warriors of long ago. So here in just four verses, we get this strange story of the sons of God coming to daughters of men and marrying them and having children who were famous and the mighty warriors of long ago. And it calls them Nephilim. Um, kind of, what is he talking about? Well, we can see throughout the rest of the Old Testament in various places that the Nephilim were described as giants. Okay, well, when we look at the book of Enoch, the book of Enoch is the details of that story. Moses did not tell the full story because it was already written down in the book of Enoch. There was no reason for him to elaborate anymore. And yet today, Christians who don't read the book of Enoch speculate and come up with all these ideas of what that meant, what those verses meant. They say, oh, the sons of God were the sons of Seth and the daughters of men were the daughters of Cain and this wasn't supposed to happen because some were good and some were bad and they were intermixing and, and they make up all these ideas that then they teach to others who teach them to others who teach them to others and this gets passed down from generation to generation until people think that that is actually what happened. But it all started as one person's speculation taught as fact. And the reality is, we're told what happened in the book of Enoch. We just don't read the book of Enoch. Furthermore, the book of Enoch tells us what the Nephilim were, where they came from, and goes into tons of detail about all of that. Enoch describes these angels who were called watchers who fell from heaven because they saw that the daughters of men, female women, human women, were beautiful. And so they said, we want to go pick some for our own wives and have our own children. And so that's what they did. They came down, they picked some wives for themselves, they had children, those children became giants. And the giants were huge. We're not talking David and Goliath, where Goliath was maybe 10 feet tall. No, the description of these giants is they were massive. Now, I think it's worth mentioning that there's actually historical and archaeological evidence for these giants. So on the screen here, you can see these skeletal figures represent just a few giant human remains that have been unearthed and documented in historical records, along with the historical accounts of Goliath, Og, King of Bashan, and Maximinus Thrax, who was a Caesar of Rome. So in this graph, you can see the first four figures on the left represent present day man, who is six foot tall, all the way there on the left. And then you've got Maximinus Thrax, Caesar of Rome in the 200s AD, who was eight foot, six inches tall. You've got Goliath, who is estimated to have been about 10, 10 and a half feet tall. And then you've got Og, King of Bashan, who is about 12 feet tall. They're all historical references to them. But if you look at the next five figures on the graph, these are archaeological digs that have dug up skeletons this size. And this is all to scale. So think of this as a little bit of reference when you're reading the story of the Israelites when they were going into the promised land and they became afraid of the inhabitants of the land because those people were giants. And they said, we're like grasshoppers before them. Okay? <laughs> yeah. No kidding. They're not talking about people the size of Goliath. Okay? They're talking about people who are huge, true giants.
And these represent just a few of many, many, many giant remains that have been unearthed and documented by archeologists and throughout history. So that's a rabbit hole that I'm not gonna go down. It's very interesting and I suggest you look into it because it provides more and more evidence for the biblical story. But the book of Enoch is documenting where these giants came from. They came from these watchers that fell who gave birth to giants. The giants were huge. They were causing tons of destruction. And more than that, the book of Enoch says that they were teaching their wives many things that have corrupted humanity from that point onward to today. Things like making weapons, making metals, making makeup, things that we call science today, things that we call magic in the ancient times. These things came from the fallen watchers who were teaching their wives how to do these things. And so eventually the good angels who had not fallen, they went to God and they said, God, you can see all the destruction that's going on on the earth and we don't know what to do. What do you want us to do about this? And so God issued a decree that they were going to be punished. Now, what ended up happening was those fallen angels, those watchers, they contacted Enoch because Enoch was a guy who knew God. They contacted Enoch and they said, please go to God on our behalf and plead our case. Ask for mercy for us. And this brings me to the point where Jesus is referencing the book of Enoch, because this is God's response. And he answered and said to me, and I heard his voice, fear not Enoch, you righteous man and scribe of righteousness. Approach here and hear my voice and go say to the watchers of heaven who have sent you to intercede for them. You should intercede for men and not men for you. Why have you left the high, holy, and eternal heaven and lain with women and defiled yourselves with the daughters of men and taken to yourselves wives and done like the children of earth and begotten giants as your sons? And though you were holy, spiritual, living the eternal life, You've defiled yourselves with the blood of women and have begotten children with the blood of flesh. And as the children of men, you've lusted after flesh and blood, as those also do who die and perish. Therefore, I've given them wives also that they might impregnate them and beget children by them that nothing might be wanting to them on earth. But you were formerly spiritual, living the eternal life and immortal for all generations of the world. And therefore I have not appointed wives for you. For as for the spiritual ones of the heaven, in heaven is their dwelling. In other words, in the book of Enoch, God says to these watchers who fell, he tells them, why did you go take wives for yourselves? I gave wives to humanity because they die. They die. And therefore, in order to make sure that they don't go extinct, they have wives and they have children to carry on their name. But you, angels, you were living the eternal life already. You don't die and therefore I did not give you wives. You don't need wives because the purpose of marriage and having children is for those who die so that they can carry on their name, so that they don't go extinct. That's the purpose. He's saying, I gave them marriage for this reason. I gave them marriage and children in order to keep them from going extinct. And you, you had eternal life. Therefore, I didn't give it to you. You don't need it. Why did you go do this? And he continues on telling them what their judgment would be for what they did. And we'll look at that later in the next couple of videos. My point is, in the New Testament, the Sadducees come to Jesus and they say, look, in the resurrection, whose wife will this person be? And Jesus is like, you guys don't know the scriptures. You're wrong because you don't know the scriptures. In the resurrection when people have eternal life, there will be no marriage. Why? 
because God gave marriage to people who die so that they can carry on their name and not go extinct. In the resurrection, when we have eternal life, we don't need it anymore. Jesus is saying, in the resurrection, people don't get married because marriage is for those who die. And in the resurrection, you have eternal life. And if you knew the book of Enoch, you'd understand that. But you Sadducees don't understand it because you don't know the scriptures, because you don't count the book of Enoch as being scripture. And now Christians read what Jesus said, and they don't understand it. Why? Because they don't know the scriptures, because they don't count the book of Enoch as being scripture. But my point with all of this is simply the fact that Jesus references the book of Enoch and says, you don't know the scriptures. If Jesus is saying, you don't know scripture, and then he points something out from the book of Enoch, Guess what that means Enoch is? That means Enoch is scripture. Jesus himself is saying so. So, to conclude this video, and we're going to move on. I, I want you to continue through this mini-series. We're going to have a, a playlist on our channel, and I want you to, to watch through that because I'm going to put forward more arguments. And I'm going to look at how the book of Enoch was heavily quoted and heavily referenced throughout the New Testament. And then I'm going to look at how the book of Enoch very explicitly prophesied Jesus. And that's actually why the Jewish people removed it from Scripture in the first place. Again, the book of Enoch was removed by the rabbis after Jesus because they hated Jesus. And the reason is because the book of Enoch prophesied Jesus more clearly than anything else. They couldn't argue against it, so they got rid of it. And so in that video, we're going to look at all the things that the book of Enoch says specifically about Jesus. But to conclude this video, my point for this video is simply to point out the two main places in the New Testament where the book of Enoch is directly referenced and the New Testament calls it prophecy and scripture. And Jesus himself is one of those two people referencing it, and he calls it scripture. So we have all these ideas in the church about the canon of scripture and where that comes from and why we can trust that there shouldn't be anything else in the Bible. And all of those ideas are built on man's arguments and man's traditions. They are. The Bible never says anywhere that these are the only books that should be in the Bible. Men have decided, men picked which books should be in the Bible, and they picked which books should be left out. It is merely a tradition of men, and we need to be careful that we are not like the Pharisees and Sadducees who reject the Word of God for the sake of human tradition. So in the next video, we're going to look at a dozen or so places where the New Testament is directly quoting or referencing the book of Enoch because it is all over the place. And this is not going to be an exhaustive list. This is just going to be a dozen or so examples that I've picked out. All of the Christian scholars acknowledge that the book of Enoch was highly, highly influential on the writings of the New Testament, on the theology of the apostles. They all acknowledge that, and yet they still insist that the book of Enoch is not what it claims to be. And yet, at the same time, they're acknowledging that the apostles and Jesus, Jesus himself, they include, clearly thought the book of Enoch is what it claims to be. The only conclusion you can come to is that these Christian scholars who write your theology books don't believe that the New Testament is really breathed out by God like it claims to be. In which case, they're not Christians. In which case, why are we listening to them in the first place? It's time that we stop following men and we start evaluating things ourselves. Be a Berean. Hear out the arguments and then just go look into it and decide what you think for yourself.